get started, I did want to say that um, my name is Diane Hoffman and I am the Artist Services Manager for Artspan. Um, Artspan is a nonprofit organization that supports um, the Bay Area artists by providing services and opportunities, uh, much like this one. Um, we, one of the ways is that we do professional development workshops. This is the very first one we've done online. Um, so bear with us. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us as we figure it out. Um, it's the first webinar I've done. They're a little different than the Zoom meetings, um, but uh, I have every confidence that we'll, we'll get through it. Um, Donnie Hill is joining us as our guest speaker, and he is with Eloquence, which is an interpersonal communication training studio. And I'll let Donnie tell you more about that, um, and as well as share his insights on public speaking, in particular for how it relates to artists. Uh, I will do more of a detailed introduction a little later, but just to test some of the functionality, go ahead and type in the chat uh, where you're calling in from just so I get a sense of where people are in the Bay. Good, so most people are, are in San Francisco. Jessica, you're with me. Okay, all right. Here's how uh, the session is gonna go down. If we aren't having fun and aren't laughing at some particular point, uh, then I'm not doing my job <laughs> because I don't wanna hear myself drone on and I know you all don't wanna hear me drone on. Um, so throughout the, the presentation, there, there's going to be a number of chat activities and then just reflective exercises that I'll have you all think about. But then at some point, um, I'll have Diane open it up so I can actually hear your voice and engage in a, a real conversation with you. So this first question is really just a chat activity. And what's been the most difficult part of communication and, and talking about what you do? Getting to the juicy part of ASAP. Yeah, how to get started. Trying not to sound too rigid. Communication mostly for business and I sound wooden stiff. Yeah, social anxiety and nervousness and Indian accent. I'm not sure what to say on this spot. Yeah, the impromptu uh, communication is often most difficult for people because there's so much uh, going on. It's hard to organize the thoughts because you're nervous. You're trying to figure out what information is going to be most relevant, and then you have the, the physicality of, of getting it out. Uh, Self-doubt and feeling like I'm not as accomplished as other, yeah, judgment. Not tripping over my own words, just relaxing. Doing artist talk at the close of an exhibit. Good. These are great. And these are very common um, things, particularly around nervousness. Um, being succinct in your messaging and, uh, and also trying to trying to figure out just how to organize your thoughts. So this is me early in my career. <laughs> I, uh, I worked as a professional actor right out of college and got to work for some incredible theater companies like the Cutting Ball in San Francisco, Theater Works down in Mountain View and Berkeley Rep. Um, and one of the one of the big things for me during that time was, oh, I'm an artist. I want to be an artist. I want to talk about um, my art and the process. Um, and what I realized is I needed to be an artist who knew business and knew how to talk about business and knew how to, to market myself. And that was a muscle that I didn't have. And in the process, what I've learned over the years is that's a muscle that many artists don't have. Um, because art for many people is such a personal um, such a personal process that we don't really think about the the selling of it or the marketing of it. It's I do it because I'm passionate about it. Or I do it because um, it inspired me. It's more of an intuitive process. Uh, and so what I had to learn quickly is if I was going to be an artist in San Francisco Bay Area and be able to pay my rent uh, and have food on the table, then I needed to be able to make a living as well. And so this is, uh, this is the other side of my experience. After I, I worked as an artist, um, I worked for a number of years for a presentation skills training company where I was their training and marketing manager. So I helped them uh, build their, their presentation skills training curriculum 
and then I, I was also a virtual producer, so I helped facilitate it as well. Uh, I later became the head of our marketing education program for a technology company, and there I worked closely with the marketing leaders, worked with digital marketing specialists, um, brand specialists, demand generation specialists. So I really learned some of the nuances and ins and outs of marketing and how to how to do that effectively in a B2B space. Um, and what I'm seeing now is, okay, and now how do I take all of those skills and apply it to the B2C world? And so this last piece, um, or the last job that I had, I was a sales enablement specialist where a lot of my training was focused on um, onboarding our new sales reps and also training them on our sales methodology. And so when I look at my career over the past, 12 years or so. Um, all of that has led me up to my communications work that I'm doing with Eloquent um, and my own consulting work that I'm doing within my own company. So we're going to talk about nervousness, messaging, and presence today. All right, so around nervousness. How does nervousness personally show up for you? Do you, uh, do you feel a, a flush in your face? Do you feel your hands tremble? Um, is there shakiness in your voice? Uh, <laughs> does your mind begin to race? What's it look like? Just go ahead and type that in the chat. You know, I feel very hot. My hands get cold and I tend to ramble. Lose train of thought. Shakiness, sometimes lose train of thought. As I over explain things and I go on and on, yeah. <laughs> I pitch the voice, shaking his hot ears. I laugh too much. <laughs> Breathing or feeling shy about saying certain things. I personally tremble and um, I feel like um, even though I know what I want to say, that somehow the words are getting caught in my mouth. Mm. You know? I can't, yeah. my, my tongue's not cooperating with my brain. <laughs> yeah, there's the, uh, the physical disconnect of um, yeah. your physical body being very present, but your mind either being way out in the, the future or somewhere in the past. Or the other way and around. Of, I feel sometimes my mind is present, but it's my body that's, that's, uh, um, freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's good noticing. Nervousness is not an issue. Wandering off the subject is a concern. Got it. Okay. Good. So when I think about nervousness, I think about it in two forms. I think about it, the physical nervousness, which are uh, exactly what you all mentioned around your voice, the shakiness, the um, the change in physiology. And then there's the, the mental side of it, which is really about how do you organize your thoughts? How do you um, stay focused? Raven said, I underspelt myself. Yeah, and part of, part of what um, I wanted to, to do as a reflective exercise, I don't have it in, in here as a slide, but um, has been rolling around in my mind a little bit is what specifically do you get nervous about? Is it that you aren't, that you aren't going to say the right thing? Um, is it that what you need to say is uncomfortable? For me, that's mine. Usually, um, usually the, uh, when I do my best work, I'm saying things that um, either go against the grain <laughs> or are uh, counterintuitive to uh, main thought. And so uh, it ends up being, it ends up being uh, this moment where my voice begins to shake and then I feel my, my body get hot. Um, but that's also my indicator of, oh, I need to say something that, um, 
that is really going to make a difference for somebody. And sometimes I don't always see it as going to make it a difference. I see it as, oh, this is the thing that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> and so for you, when you think about, um, when you think about your own work, what is your nervousness around? And Diane, same question for you. What's your nervousness around? It's, it's about uh, all those, I, it's usually a public situation where there's an audience and they're all facing me. I mean, going mm -hmm. into a, a less formal situation, I'm usually pretty comfortable. I, I think of myself as a people person. I'm very comfortable talking about my art, but it's something about the audience setting, like the chairs all aligned in a row and all of these eyes directed intently on me. It just rattles mm -hmm. me. Uh, it's a different it's a it's a formalness that's that makes me uncomfortable so it's, it's forgetting to say what's important even though i know it yep holly i'm nervous about making content mistakes not being accurate yeah so holly when when you think about the the iq the eq part of communication um the iq side is around right and wrong accuracy and inaccuracy and so part of um, part of navigating in that space is really thinking about, okay, uh, I'm going to try and provide as much accurate information as possible, uh, but also what's the, what's the emotional component of what I'm saying as well? And how do I weave that into, into my story or into my message? Read the same. It's about saying something about myself or my own thoughts. Uh, that another would disagree with or have judgments against me. Like maybe they don't like my work or something like that. Yeah, Rita. Uh, when we have, when we have to stand in our own personal uh, opinion and beliefs and share that with people, it gets scary because it's like, no, this isn't this isn't the collective talking. This is Donnie talking or this is Rita talking. Um, and so it's that feeling of you know who's gonna am I gonna get the bullet? All right, so some of the things that you can do for physical nervousness. Um, this, I, I'll mute my phone in a bit because I don't, I don't want to, you to hear it echo. Um, but a lot of times what, what ends up happening is as we get nervous, um, all of the energy moves up. And so we end up speaking and thinking from here and our physical body, um, we just, forget about it and so um, part of part of the exercise that I want to have you do is just giving you some tools that you can use to get back in your body so I'm gonna uh, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do and then I just want you to take some time to do it so the first thing that I do is um, when people uh, one of the areas where people have uh, nervous twitches is around their hands uh, and so just go ahead and, and move your hands a little bit. See if you can find some, get some sensation, rub your fingers together. I'm going to put myself on mute, but go ahead and just clap your hands together. And see, after you clap them, see if you feel any tingling, more tingling. All right, and the same is uh, I hold a lot of tension in in my my traps and my shoulders, and so just go ahead and shrug them all the way up and release, and shrug them up and release, and then shrug them up one more time and release. And so part of what we're doing right now is constricting the muscles and relaxing them. Um, and what ends up happening, if you do that over and over for a couple of times, you just end up lengthening the muscle and, and helping it to relax a little more. And that's something that I still do um, when I give presentations. It's something that I still do when I'm teaching a course, because I know by the end of the day, I'll, <laughs> I'll end up like this. And so I have to con conscientiously um, do that exercise to help me remember to relax and get into my body. Um, one of the things that I, I did in my acting training was I took a movement class 
and during their movement class, um, there were several days where we had to stand in front of stand in front of uh, the room and not say a thing, but just stand there. And you you really begin to notice all your nervous ticks and twitches, and our teacher would just say, "Yeah, I see you have some tension in your shoulder. Just go ahead and relax it and let it go." Um, to the point where I can now stand in front of the room for the most part with my hands down by my side, and that feels very comfortable and home base for me. But I also know that that's not the case for many people. So what ends up happening is you'll your nervousness ends up coming out in a bunch of different ways. So um, sometimes, sometimes it ends up being, you know, the uh, the praying in front of <laughs> in front of the audience, um, or you you do the fig leaf, or you put your hands behind your back, um, and those aren't those aren't wrong, uh, but what what how he reads is he just makes you look nervous and then the audience gets nervous for you because you're nervous. And so typically what I tell people when you're dealing with nervousness is okay, once you do the exercise with your hands, see if you can just relax them down by your side. And just just stand there for ten seconds, fifteen seconds. Count to ten or fifteen and, and see if you can let your body relax. And as you're doing it over and over again, it just becomes a, a practice for you. And so that's part of one of the, the physical practices that I do. Uh, the next piece is around the, the mental side of nervousness. And I'm going to go ahead and go into um, the next little part of the presentation, our next topic, which is around messaging. Um, for many people, what ends up happening with the mental focus is, like you all said, you lose your train of thought, or if you have to, you're asked to speak um, on the fly, then you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I organize myself, or how do I organize my thoughts? And this is something that I, I use with many of my clients um, to help them get really clear about what it is they they want to say or what it is they want the audience to do. Is um, is asking this question: What specifically? do you want me to do as an audience member as a result of your communication? So if you're thinking about a talk that you have that's coming up, um, what specifically do you want the audience to do? Do you want them to buy a piece of art from you? Do you want them to give you a, a call? Do you want them to bring you in to, um, to be a part of their exhibit? Go ahead and, and type that in chat. Uh, Rita said to be considered for an exhibit or make connections with other artists. Yep. Uh, I want people to view my artwork and offer feedback or insights. Uh, yes, a purchase would be great, though not my ultimate goal uh, to understand and enjoy the work I'm talking about and why I created it. So, yeah, I want them to be engaged and interested in what I'm saying. I want them to come away feeling they just spent their time well and know me and my ideas. Uh, I want them to be intrigued. I want them to believe in me and my vision get excited about the history and relevance of the place I talk about support a historic preservation effort and help support the staff center. Awesome. When I first was getting ready to to put together this presentation, one of the the ideas that kept coming um, to mind was purpose driven art. Um and I didn't really know where that was going to go. Part of my my artistic mind is I think of puzzle pieces and will write down the puzzle pieces or type them in my phone. And I have no clue how they're going to connect together. But at some point, they, <laughs> they connect. Um, so when you think about your own, your own artwork, um, what's, the, what's the why behind it? Why is it important to you? Connections Friday bring joy. Find the best, but in the future. Yep. That's one of the questions that makes me nervous. So, oh, fantastic. Then Jennifer is that it is part of your homework. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the reason why I bring that 
bring this question up is because when you're marketing your work, when you're selling your work, part of what people really want to know is why are you doing your work? What I, I found when I would try and explain my work as an actor is, um, yeah, here's my, here's some of the, the pieces that I worked on um, and they were fun because of X, Y, Z. But what I learned eventually is that people wanted to know what art gave me or what acting gave me uh, that helped improve my quality of life in some form or fashion. And what I found um, once I shared that, then people shared their own experiences. And so think of your artwork as a catalyst for a new conversation. Yes, it's about your artwork, but yes, it's about helping the person that you're in conversation with connect to the artists within themselves, even if they say, oh, you know, I can never do that. I, I'm not an artist like that. Because there's something about your work that inspires them to engage with you. Carrington, still trying to figure it out. Uh, Chandrika, to help you identify your emotions and feel like we're all in the same boat. Yeah. This sounds self-centered, but it's to show my unique vision and experience. It's informed by being formerly homeless and recovery by racial urban girl. Zan, yes, 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 yes. Look, I, I think if I learned anything out of working in, um, in corp, uh, corporate environment is that everybody has an agenda. Whether, you know, how we label it, positive, negative, et cetera, it doesn't matter. Um, I have an agenda, you have an agenda, we as an artist have an agenda, and it's about getting people to be interested in the work that we're doing, and that's perfectly okay. Um, I think what ends up happening is we try, we try so hard to push it away that it ends up, um, one, not working in our favor, and two, coming off in, in this weird way. And so, Zan, the fact that you you shared that is is big because it's true for every human being. <laughs> um, and so part of part of the opportunity for you now is that you just get to share your vision with people um, and come from this place of here's why I do work. Um, this was my experience dealing with homelessness. This is my experience dealing with recovery. This is my experience being a, a biracial urban girl. And it informs everything that I do. And I just wanted to share my experience with people. And there are going to be people who connect with it because they're in the same boat as you. And there are going to be people who connect with it um, because of the sincerity uh, and uh, the authenticity of your your message and your willingness just to be who you are. <laughs> Once you have uh, a sense of why you do what you want to do, or as you're starting to think about why you do um, what you do, the next piece, the next piece is, um, is really where I think the communication um, becomes less about you and more about the listener. And I started using this analogy just because it, it, it's really easy for people to understand and it, they connect with it in an emotional way. When I think about my work as an, um, as an artist or when I think about my work as a facilitator, what I'm doing is simply helping people cross the street. Um, sometimes I want them to cross the street to come to my island. And sometimes I just want to help them cross the street to get to where it is they they want to go. And so I think as you're, as you're thinking about your work, um, one, of the, one of the pieces is, what am I trying to help this person do? If I'm trying to get them interested in, in my work, how is it going to be valuable to them? How is it going to um, be beneficial to them? How is it going to make their life better? easier, uh, more uplifting, more inspiring, more joyful. Um, because then you, you'll you start talking about that versus talking about your art. So as you, you think about your own um, streets and your, 
you're the cross guard. What street are you helping your your listeners cross or your audience members cross? What's on the other side and um, why is that other side beneficial? We have Rita, maybe a new perspective on subjects I know and care about. Awesome, Jennifer. I would like to answer their questions about my artwork and feel satisfied with the answers I give. Yeah, Jennifer, what are some what are some questions that you get asked um, by the people who view your artwork? Uh, Holly, I'm hoping to help them cross over to exploring women's spirituality and how it relates to visual culture. Awesome. Uh, Carrington, Sean, to hopefully expose them uh, in a way to a way of seeing that perhaps they haven't considered before. Uh, before I chat, Rita, it's tough to know what other people would want out of an interaction. Yeah, Rita, um, you can know what someone else wants out of the interaction. And so that's why it's really important to, to be clear about what particularly you want out of the interaction. Um, because you, you know that they're, they might want something, but if you're clear about why you're going into it, then it makes it, it, makes it much easier to uh, guide the conversation. <laughs> and then it also makes it easier for you to open up the conversation to, um, to new areas that they might not have thought of. Audrey, when you have one listener, you can figure out what they need to cross the street. How does that change when you're talking to many people uh, at once? Yes, Audrey. So, so for this part, of, uh, uh, this is a, a perfect example. When I think about talking to, say, you versus Diane around nervousness, messaging, and presence, it's going to look very different for each one of you because you all have different um, nuances to your verbal and nonverbal communication. So part of what uh, I have to do as a facilitator and what you have to do as an artist, I think about what are the big buckets or the big themes that I want to discuss, and then how do I give people enough information um, and enough clarity and focus to think about those themes in relationship to them and what they do. And so as you're thinking about your own, as you're thinking about your own art, um, say you're, I'm going to stick with the acting thing because that is, that's what I know. Uh, I'm thinking about movement. I'm thinking about singing and I'm thinking about um, speech training. Uh, each person is going to have, is going to have a different relationship to movement. Each person is going to have a different relationship to singing and each uh, person is going to have a different relationship to speech training. So I would say, all right, as you're thinking about movement, I want you to be aware of what do you do with your upper body and what do you do with your lower body? Now that person would spend time thinking about, well, my upper body, I hold, um, I hold tightly. And so I need to be more free, whereas somebody else might be free up top. And now they're just getting more specific around, all right, well, I have a lot of freedom in my, my arms, but now I want to be um, more precise in what I do with my fingers and how I use my hands. Uh, so when you're thinking about your own artwork, um, that's, where, that's where you would begin to become more of a facilitator versus I'm going to try and answer everybody's question. Let me know if that is helpful. Uh, and I guess then it would be to help others experience their own strength and vulnerability. Yeah. Jennifer, what's the symbolism? Why did you put that in there? What does that mean? That's to answer your question about the kind of questions she gets. Got it. And Jennifer, when you think about your responses, um, are they, do they, include your personal perspective or do you try and remove yourself from the personal perspective? Uh, so Ed, in showing my perspective in my work, I love to find commonalities between us showing we're all connected and one. Yeah, sure, sure. It seems like many are expecting very defined symbolism and strong narratives with my word when I'm actually very resistant to that. Yeah. But I, I want to stop here uh, just so I can, 
see if anybody wants to hop on and verbally share any ideas, anything they've gotten out of the conversation so far, or if people think, you know, this wasn't what I expected at all. <laughs> this wasn't what I expected at all. I wish you would talk about X, Y, Z. Um, I'm happy to, to hear that as well. Hello. I didn't have a question, but um, you guys are doing a really, really great job. <laughs> uh, thank it's really, you. <laughs> and, um, it's lovely that you say the names of some of the people because I know them personally and it makes me feel really happy that they're all there getting your um, great inspiration and support for doing something that's so challenging to be an artist to begin with. And then to put yourself up on stage and talk about yourself is in a whole nother element. So thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. You are very, very welcome. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, um, thank John, you. By the way, Joanne is Artspan's executive director. <laughs> <laughs> nice to so meet you. We got a thumbs up from Joanne. I think we're doing okay. <laughs> I ah. frequently rehearse, but then don't sound very natural. I'm used to talking about money to audience and talking about art. Yes. Um, what I typically Typically how I prefer to prepare um, my presentation is I'll do bullet points. <laughs> I, was telling, I was telling Diane uh, before we joined that I'm a very fluid presenter and preferably I, I like to have an idea and then in the moment, uh, sometimes what I thought I'd talk about and I'll talk about and there have been times where I threw my entire presentation out as soon as I stepped on stage and decided to go in a different direction because it was it was what was called for and needed at that particular time. Um, but I also recognize that, that that is not everybody's jam. And so what I what I recommend as you're thinking about your presentation, have an idea, have your main idea and then the the concepts that you want to talk about around that idea but i'll tip i typically don't recommend scripting your presentation because of that very um scenario where it becomes too rehearsed and too rigid and too um too robotic that once people do that they feel like oh i i can't break away from this structure um whereas if you have a bullet point you're like okay i know i just need to talk about this and then there's a lot more freedom to say, all right, here are the pieces that I want to talk about it now, or this is something that the audience brought, brought up. So now I can shift my focus a little bit and um, talk about these ideas around this particular topic instead of saying, all right, here's my, here's my script. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to it. So, uh, uh, so uh, maybe, yeah. Oh, I just was reading Soad's question about um, talk a little bit about asking audience good questions to keep them engaged and keep the conversation moving forward. Yes, uh, I, I'm a big advocate for asking the audience um, questions. What I'll typically do is <laughs> uh, try and ask strategic questions if possible around the topic uh, and also uh, be very specific in the question. And so, for instance, um, one of the things I, I asked about is how does nervousness show up for you? Like what I'm looking for is I wanted to see are, are there going to be, are people going to respond to saying I have nervousness shows up in my physicality or does nervousness show up in my my mental focus and clarity? Because that was a part of my my framework and my conversation. So as long as you're asking questions, I think it's great. I think it's a, a good way to get people um, to voice their opinion and you don't spend the entire time, <laughs> entire time talking, um, but you also have to be very comfortable with, with being the facilitator when need be and say, oh, you know what, that's a very interesting question and I know we're gonna, we're gonna have some more time at the end. Um, let's bring that question to the end because I think, um, we'll be able to talk about it and add more length or however you want to frame it. That way it allows you to stay on track and you continue telling the audience, hey, I'm driving the bus. 
funny. Uh, Audrey has a question that she wanted to ask directly. Audrey, are you there? Sure. Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, a situation I, I think a lot of artists share, which is that we get asked the same questions over and over again. And I just wondered if you could give us some actorly tips on keeping it fresh as we mm. uh, <laughs> respond to uh, <laughs> that, that is a brilliant question, Audrey. I get asked the same <laughs> questions uh, hundreds of times in one day during yep. open days. Yeah. So what is your most painful question to be asked? Oh, I get asked, uh, uh, I have a body of work that I do with little uh, figures and I get asked where they come from. So it's it's a question that doesn't really have anything to do with my soul. <laughs> it's a question about, it's a really a practical question and I, um, and people ask it as if, you know, I've, I've never been asked before. Um, so I, I, I do consider it sort of a Buddhist uh, practice of fresh, you know, of sort of beginner's mind, you know, every time that it's a, it's the first time they've asked me that question. But I just wondered if you had any, uh, any tips from that. Yeah, for me, um, when things become repetitive, I really have to find what interests me about it. Um, so for instance, the, the, very, the very last show that I did, Prior to prior to the one I <laughs> I decided to do last year was seven seven or eight years ago, and it was a a tour along the West Coast, and I was performing two or three shows a day, uh, and it was a story about Jackie Robinson. Uh, so the language used in the show was extremely taxing, uh, to say the least. And one of the things that I, I found myself having to do is, why am I interested in this particular thing? Um, why am I interested in this particular work? Why am I interested in this particular figure? What figure was, what figure is the most memorable? Um, what figure has the, the most humorous story? Um, what figure was the most painful uh, to create, to find, uh, et cetera. So it really becomes more nuanced about how I think about it. Uh, because if I can find the humor in it, then it allows me to connect with it in a very different way. And then it, it's less about me explaining to the person um, the same story over and over again. And it's more about me just personally connecting to, oh, now I remember that I had to go to three stores in Sacramento, Sunnyvale, and Eureka to try and find this figurine. Um, and in the process, I, uh, I, wow, I got to connect with an old friend. I stopped by and had some wine because there was a, a winery on the side of the street. Um, and it, it just allows, you might say the same thing over and over again, uh, but how it comes out just sounds different and it's different for you. All right, uh, let's see. I see Holly hunching to the podium for dear life and reading the slides verbatim. Not so much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Holly, typically what I'll, I'll do, and I have, to, I have to make this a practice of my own as well, um, I'll find a picture that represents the idea of what I want to talk about uh, rather than having bullet points because it's so easy to to just go down and read the list, it's particularly when you're nervous, when you're tired, um, when you just want to get off the stage. Uh, and it, it allows you to engage with the slides as you're looking up on the projector. Uh, or you're looking at your computer, it allows you to engage with the material differently and then it helps you go back to the audience. Uh, one of the things that I, I found really fascinating um, during my, my actor journey is when I finished college, I wanted to apply to, MF, or I applied to MFAs um, to get a, a <laughs> my master's in acting. And 
I was so nervous for my very first MFA audition um, that the the casting director, who I knew, who had been a guest lecturer in a number of my classes, he said to me, Donnie, I just want you to succeed. Know that that's all anybody wants you to do um, as, an, as a casting director. And that really shifted the way that I, I think about presentations and I think about sharing my work. Um, because the audience has shown up to hear what you have to say and they hear about your work and your idea, so they want you to succeed. And the more you can uh, remember that and find opportunities to engage with them, to look them in the eyes, to make that one-on-one -on -one connection, when we get to be back in person with one another, I think you'll you'll find that it ends up helping calm you a little more than you think, um, because you're just connecting with people. Uh, Stacy, how much time do I give for talk and for questions for audience? How much time to allow for each? How do I practice timing and stay within allowed amount of time? Uh, yes. So with with audience, uh, I'll typically do I'll typically do anywhere from ten ten to fifteen minutes of content to 10 to 15 minutes of, um, of Q&A. Uh, and if I can get through the content earlier or sooner, then the better, and then allows more time for Q&A. Uh, it might be a little different in the artist world versus in the business world. When I gave presentations to executives, I spent maybe five or 10 minutes giving, speaking to my content, and the remainder, if I had a 30 minute slide, the remainder um, was answering their questions and facilitating. And so part of the reason why I share that with you is if you're thinking about your work um, where you're speaking as a business owner versus speaking as just an art or artist and educator, then that, that uh, ratio might <laughs> might move depending on um, the purpose of the the presentation or the interaction. Uh, so talk and half depending on the length of the talk. Mine usually 40 to 45 minutes. Good question on difficult topics. Yeah, so if you're giving a 45 minute presentation, typically what ends up happening is you'll you'll talk for 25 to 30 minutes and then the remaining time will be for Q&A. And for Q&A, I recommend having some, having some questions on hand for yourself in case you have a very quiet audience. Um, and they can be some of the commonly asked questions that you get. They could be some of the difficult questions that you, <laughs> that you get asked. Uh, they could be some of the more lighthearted and playful questions that you get asked, just so you have a, um, a wide range. Uh, let's see, Chandrika. Can hmm, can you su suggest some ways to learn vocal modulation and projection? Yes, well, vocal modulation has uh, <laughs> has a couple of different different nuances to it. Vocal modulation could be up sync, where everything sounds like a question, even though you're really making a statement. Uh, and then you have monotone, where everything is uh, in the same note. So there's a little bit of variation, but um, there is not a whole lot of differentiation between your your pitches or your your registers. Um, and what ends up happening is in the monotone, when people are monotone, people are using the lower part of their register, um, where there's very little modulation. And what we, we want to do is just practice going up just a little higher and starting the pitch higher. And so uh, one of the exercises that I'll, I'll use for that with my clients is uh, what I call gliding, gliding pitches versus stepping pitches. And when you think about uh, stepping pitches, it, it would sound something like, I can make my voice go higher. And then from up here, I would start my sentence. So now I can make my voice go lower. And then 
the stepping pitch channel would be, I can make my voice go lower. And it just allows you to practice using uh, a wider range uh, of your register. Some singing exercises are good, humming exercises are good, where you just um, go up and down the register. Uh, just so you can hear it for yourself. Then uh, the next little piece is around uh, what's on your island. Okay, so if you're thinking about uh, your messaging and you're having people across the street and you're wanting them to specifically come to your side of the, the street or come to your island, what's the benefit and the value of going to your island? How, again, how is life going to be? How's life going to be uh, better or different or more enjoyable? Um, so if you're thinking about presentations that you have where you're really trying to influence someone's decision, this is a good question to ask yourself um, to get clear about, all right, what specifically do I want them to do? And how is it going to be of value to them? All right. And then the last piece is really around presence and that means your your physical presence so obviously in the in the physical space or in person space um you want to keep a, an open body posture and what i tell people is think about uh, a line going right down the center of your body and this is your midline um so this is your open and then this it means you're crossing the midline and what ends up happening if you have say a podium um, that's in front of you or you have a podium that's by, uh, to the side of you, you'll see people like leaning up against the podium and then they'll get really comfortable and then eventually it becomes like this. Or if they're standing behind the podium, they may start like this, but then eventually they become um, hunched over. And part of it is the nervousness. And so what I, what I recommend is getting away from the podium so you have to be you have to be open and out with your audience. And it also just reads differently. Like being behind a podium reads as, oh, as hiding or um, reads as disconnected. Like I have to cross a barrier in order to connect with you. Whereas the art, as an artist, you want people to connect with you. And so part of the reason um, I personally believe artists are so beautiful is because there's an openness uh, to us as human beings that non-artists really appreciate. And so you have, okay, so you have the physical presence. Um, the next piece around presence is now that everything is moving to uh, the virtual space, here's some things that you want to think about. Um, look, when you're talking to an individual or you're talking to a larger audience like this, I'm looking directly into the camera. Um, this is my way of feeling like I'm connecting with you. And so just down in the chat, go ahead and, and let me know as I'm talking to you and thinking uh, and explaining this to you, does it feel like I'm connecting directly with you or does it feel like I'm looking somewhere else? <laughs> directly with us, great. And so this is this is the the medium that we have to use for now is the camera is our friend and as much as I don't enjoy the camera I'm having to <laughs> to become friends with the uh, the camera very quickly so that's one piece the next piece is um, wherever possible put some books or a box or something underneath your laptop so that your camera is eye level right now this is my my little box that I'm using to, to make sure that I'm, I'm looking directly into the camera. That way, um, we're not looking up your nostrils and we're not looking down at you. Good. All right, so you have your box, you have your, your camera. Um, when you think about your gestures or real estate and taking up space, um, what I tell people is this is, this is Donnie Island. I have all of the space around me to lay out information so that it's easier for you to um, to follow along with me. And and part of your work as a, a strategic communicator is really making it super simple for the audience to follow along. Follow along. 
And so um, when I think about gestures, part of the reason why I use gestures uh, is sometimes <laughs> is because they help um, convey a specific point. And part of the reason I use gestures is because it, I'm using the space. And so it just makes me feel more comfortable. And it also um, makes me feel more engaged in the content that I'm talking about. And it also changes my voice. So, Chandrika, when you're thinking about vocal modulation, what ends up happening when you get nervous, you become restricted and you hold tighter and it becomes, um, it becomes smaller. Whereas if you also think about using more of your physical space, then that can help with the modulation as well, because sometimes your natural gestures will make your voice um, go up in the in pitch or in, in inflection. So now this is looking directly into the camera versus now I'm looking at the monitor and I'm just looking at Diane. And so can you all tell the difference between when I'm communicating with you here versus when I'm communicating with you here? And part of it is, again, is that physical comfort and the physical ease piece. Um, once you begin using your body, it, you're going to engage differently with your audience and you're also going to engage differently with your content. Um, one of the things that my movement teacher used to tell me is when my hands begin shaking or something, something on my body begins twitching, is my body's way of uh, letting me know that it wants to be used in some way. <laughs> And so if your hand's shaking, sometimes that means you, maybe, maybe you can use a gesture to, to describe what you're talking about, or maybe you can use some kind of invitational gesture to invite the person into the conversation with you. And that way uh, it allows the, the energy and the nervousness to release a little bit. So you're a fan of um, using body language then and, and communicating like hand gestures and because uh, so if your hands are trembling, you're, you say you make <laughs> use of them, huh? So you're a big fan yeah. of like that sort of uh, physical, physical aspect. It, is it I ever, do. Is it, can, can it Go ever ahead. be taken too far where it's distracting? I mean, yeah. I guess there's a fine line. Yeah. What I, what I think, if you're using your gestures, then you need to be able to, you need to use them strategically, not on autopilot. So if you're constantly just flailing and doing this kind of motion, uh, then it becomes distracting because your body is physically doing something different than your message. But if, if for instance, I'm talking about, all right, uh, today I'm going to describe two pieces of art. Um, the first are my little figurines that I'm talking about, and then the next piece that I'm talking about um, is this uh, this bigger piece that I created. And so what I did there was really use them to demonstrate what I'm talking about versus them being very um, mm -hmm. nondescript. Okay. Good. Then with that, Here's my, my last way, my last way, my, my last uh, point and, and really the takeaway. As you're thinking about your communication, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, it's really about your listener. It's not about you. So as you're thinking about what it is you, you want to say or how you want to guide the conversation um, or how you want to engage with the person, um, think about verbally all right, what's going to make it easy for this person to say yes to me? Or what's, it, what's going to make it easy for this um, person to continue engaging in an ongoing conversation with me? And when you're thinking about um, your nonverbal communication is what's going to help the audience um, get a visual of what it is that I'm talking about? Uh, because that that then takes <laughs> takes some of the the guesswork off them about what they should do or what they need to do, uh, and it's more about you just helping them um, helping them follow along with you and get an understanding of what it is that you're talking about. It's a practice. I uh, even as a, a communication coach, there sometimes I'll 
be in conversations and then I get out of the conversation and realize, wow, I, I don't even know whether or not I answered that question for the person. <laughs> um, and it, it's one of those things that's beautiful because communication you're doing most of the time, every day, all day. And so it's a practice that you can always get better at. Uh, and that's one of the, the joys of it for me. And I hope will eventually become one of the, the joys for you as well. Then with that, I just want to, uh, to get, what were some of your, your takeaways from the session today? Uh, Jessica says, that, uh, useful, helpful, and enjoyable. Lots of tips for me, who is now an artist, but used to teach presentation skills. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, Zan says, uh, to own my truth and focus on the listener more. That's what Zan got out of it. Um, Polly says, I learned that it's really about generosity to communicate. You need to relate to what people need and want to know, not what you want to tell them. And uh, Kay says, this was very good and practical advice that can be easily implemented. Thank you very much. You are Jessica, very welcome. <laughs> Jessica says, uh, lots of good suggestions. I like the IQ versus the EQ concept. I do too, Jessica. Sean says, I'll be better able to guide my talk and engage my audience. And Soad says, yes, generosity and gratitude. Yes, yes, the key to life, really. Um, Sean says, thank you for spending time with us this evening. Sun says, yes, please. Uh, You're Kay says, that very was welcome. Great. And you, oh, and Joan says, you both did a superb job. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Hey, before thank everyone you. goes completely away, um, I do want to thank Donnie so very much for doing this with me. Um, you're wonderful. I couldn't have picked a better person to have guided us through this. And anything else, Donnie, we should say before we call it a night? Uh, no, I think I think this has this has been a really enjoyable experience for me. So, Diane and Definitely. Joan, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And it's been a pleasure working with you all and getting to know you. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing how things go for you. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, I, I'm definitely gonna stay in touch with you. We'd love to have you back again. Just let me know. <laughs> okay, for sure. I'll leave, um, I'll leave the webinar open for a few more minutes so everyone has a chance to answer the poll. And, uh, oh, we got clapping loudly from SOA. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and being a part of it. Mm -hmm.